yes, this was a moment of rejection, but it was also an opportunity for me to be really still, to hear all of their criticism and feedback, which I knew was all bullshit, and to say, it's okay for you to think that, but you're not paying, right? Is your name on the check? Because the name on the check is Uncle Sam, and it's FAFSA. And then now, as a published author, how do I re deal with rejection, you might ask? Uh, oh my God. I, I don't know. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. And you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Welcome to another video on my channel. And today, I want to talk about something that I have a lot of experience with. <laughs> As an artist of color, it's rejection. What is rejection, you might say? It's when you don't get what you fucking want. And we're going to talk about how you deal with it, how you process it, and how I've dealt with it as an artist that has been in the game for about 10 years, has a book published, and still gets rejected all the time. Those that don't know, my name is Prince. I'm a published author that published my first book, When They Tell You To Be Good, two years ago. I make content about Black history, queer and radical perspectives on capitalism and Black culture. I've definitely been going through an existential shift, and this always happens to me when I'm feeling a lot internally. I don't really know where to place it. I don't know. I think I just go through spells of loneliness where I'm like, no one understands me. I got rejected from this grant that I thought I was a shoe in for, and... Then I had to like go to a party where like two of my friends also got the grant. And with being an artist online and you're on social media, even another friend recently, like his book cover just came out for or their new book. And there's so much rejection and comparison in the art world. And I think it's very, very important for us to clearly talk about it. And even though I'm published, even though I've been teaching for the past year and a half, even though I'm more comfortable than I've ever been financially as an artist, I still deal with envy. And that's alongside the fact that I'm very proud of the career and the art life that I've built for myself. Like I'm mostly freelance, I have free time. I can devote time to things like organizing or liberation work or video work, etc. You work so hard and you're aware of all the structural obstacles and all the things that can go wrong. And in an industry where you can apply to as many things as you want or take as many chances as you want, but even when you're rejected, you're not always given the right amount of feedback. And so there can be a lot of gray areas, a lot of weirdness, a lot of messiness in how we face rejection as artists, what it can awaken in us, where we are facing rejection from. Maybe people in your family or your friends don't understand why you want to be an artist. And so not only is there rejection, not only is there comparing ourselves to others, but there's also this sense of isolation that all these feelings can give and force onto you. And as someone that's very prone to these bouts of emotion, I want to describe a certain like number of qualities in how I kind of deal with their face rejection. And then I want to talk about some periods of time in my life where I've actionably dealt with a lot of rejection and it's messed me up. And I had to figure out some ways to process it. So this video is going to be helpful for anyone that is an artist that is maybe going through a weird period in your artwork, you're second guessing yourself. And maybe you want to hear from someone that's been in the game for a period of time and has found some of my own ways to process these things. And none of this is saying that I'm perfect because <laughs> I'm someone that has to verbalize my frustration. And so if I'm around friends, they're good. They're like, oh my God, are you okay? And I'm like, I just have to get out. So this is me getting it out. Let's go. So what can rejection look like if you're an artist, especially a artist of color, a black artist, queer artist? And I have a few things written down. Rejection can look like a lot of different things. It can literally look like being told no and you know why or you don't know why. If you're trying to sell a book and you're on submissions and you get no after no after no and it's all vague, you're kind of like, what am I supposed to do with this when we're in an industry that claims it wants more diverse voices? Rejection can also look like being reached out with with opportunities that seem really exciting and, and daring in the beginning. And then once you inquire about details or payment, people go radio silent. The offer isn't as good as you thought it was or they painted it to be. It can feel misleading. It's not feeling welcome in all art spaces. Maybe you go to a residency or a school or a class or a workshop and your art isn't really understood or it's brushed aside for a variety of reasons that are outside of the status quo of that space. Being hyper aware of the gatekeepers, the people blocking your way. As a writer, it's needing to put your work online and then having a presence and then needing a, needing a 
agent to help you sell your book if you want to be traditionally published. And then the agent gets you an editor and then the editor helps you. They have to edit it with their team. And in, in so much of the art world, there's gatekeepers, people you have to go through to buy your art, to validate your art, to write about you, to put your name out there. And it can feel really frustrating when these gatekeepers aren't really interested in the actual meaning or integrity of the art. And they're rather interested in platform privilege or what is easy or accessible to them. A really big sign of going through rejection or what it can look like is you feel isolated. And, and this might be the most important way that I know that I'm feeling a lot of rejection or it's moving through me is that I suddenly start to get like, I don't want to say woe is me, but I'm hyper aware of how weird a certain kind of rejection made me feel, how it's kind of causing me to question my value for a variety of reasons. And this can come up in a variety of ways. Maybe you're going through a tough time emotionally in your social life. Maybe something just happened in your career that destabilized you. Maybe um, something art-wise fell through and you don't really know how to talk about it or it feels weird to talk about it. All of these things can make you feel isolated and they can be a byproduct of rejection. And as someone that has been published, as someone that is freelanced, as someone that is taught, I think in a lot of ways I can look at my career and be grateful for all the things that I've done in my 29, almost 30 years. But in a lot of other ways, I look back and I think of all the different ways that I could have done something sooner or I was ready sooner, but I had to wait for someone to say yes to me. And so this feeling of rejection in my mind or in the ways that I've experienced it is also an attempt to kind of look at what I'm individually to blame for in terms of my lack of effort or or the effort that I did put in or what I'm not to blame for. What is structural? Am I applying to things or looking for opportunities that aren't suited towards people like me? Am I trying to wedge my way into an industry that naturally locks people like me out? And what is the value of pushing my way in based on my dream of being an author or a certain kind of artist? And all of these things can deeply be in, in contradiction with each other. And I think it's important to talk about these contradictions so when they come up again and again we can have new and better language to understand why so the first time that i can really say that i confronted rejection and had to overcome it as a writer slash artist was in high school by the end of my high school which was i graduated at 17 I had been writing for a good three or four years. I had written two or three novels. I was obsessed. Everyone I knew knew me as a writer. And I also grew up in the era of high school where, it's, where you were really encouraged to go towards STEM and study something practical. And I remember at the end of my senior year, I had to sit down with my guidance counselor and our parent. Like that's how my school arranged us having like one of the pivotal conversations with our guidance counselor about what we wanted to study and why. And I remember telling... <laughs> My, my mom and this guy it's counselor that I wanted to study English for university and they both looked at me like oh god no and they berated me for 45 minutes they talked down about it they said it was lofty that I needed to do something rational or that like basically they were just saying that like it was a lofty pie in the sky dream and I needed to do something more rational and I remember even at the age of 16 objectively outside of myself knowing that Usually their opinions would matter, but I think by this point I'd come out, I had dealt with so much weird, intense stuff on a family level, I'd found this interior world and writing had helped me find it. And so to sit in front of these two adults that didn't really know much about my writing, like even at that point my mother hadn't really read much of it for real, I just kept thinking like how can I listen to people give me advice when they don't even understand what my needs are, what my desires are, and as soon as I started to understand that in my head. Yes, this was a moment of rejection, but it was also an opportunity for me to be really still, to hear all of their criticism and feedback, which I knew was all bullshit, and to say, it's okay for you to think that, but you're not paying, right? They weren't paying, they weren't paying. Even if my mother had these desires for what she wanted me to study and how she wanted me to study, and I know people's parents are different, Luckily, my mom was very much against it, but my mother gave me like a little nest egg to go to university, which was a few thousand dollars. Everything else for university, I had to cover with scholarships and loans. And this isn't to say like my mother didn't help me in a tons of ways, but financially being responsible for my own college journey made it way more possible for me to look at these two adults and say, I hear what you're saying, but is your name on the check? Because the name on the check is Uncle Sam, and it's 
FAFSA. I look back at this and I'm really grateful that I could see this as a moment of rejection by people in my life for the dreams that I wanted, but I also saw it as, it was the first time where I really, really clearly understood like, I mean, this is my choice, right? Like as an artist, so what's the problem? I did study creative writing. I went into university. I took all the different courses, English comp. I took numerous Shakespeare courses. We read Canterbury Tales and I, we read Dante's Inferno and I was not the typical English major. Not many black students in my program. I went to a predominantly white institution too. I just wasn't that well read. Like I enjoyed English and literature going into university and I still did, but I hadn't like memory logged all these things. I wasn't able to reference things. I also went to a pretty good public school in an inner city. It wasn't in a nice neighborhood that had all these extra bells and whistles compared to my other, to the other English majors who had gone to different schools and maybe were studying differently and had a different kind of way of memory or connecting with literature. And I think when I was studying, I realized, but I think I love it almost more on a philosophical level, less on a canonical level, because we would have to read all these older writers and it just wouldn't be interesting to me. And I'm, and on some level, a part of what I was working through in college was how a lot of literature classes had kind of de-racialized kind of the process of looking into literature. And I think I felt that even more in university where I was in these classes and I was like, I appreciate what we're learning, but I'm not really connecting with it. And and a lot of that was, college was also the time where I didn't need to be a goody two shoes. I wasn't expected to have good grades. No one was looking over my shoulder. And so in a lot of ways, I look back and I'm like, oh, I was kind of like a rebel English major. I didn't really read a lot of the assignments and I would skip class and I would also debate with the teachers who are kind of like weird or white or kind of authoritarian. And I was really good at responding in class and then other students would kind of be like, I know you didn't read. I'm like, shut the fuck up. I read the Amber's Auto Reviews. I kind of wanted a professor who would take interest in me and want to mentor me. Um, and none of those things really happened on a classic academic level. And I felt it throughout the years again and again. I think at least once a year, I always had a teacher where I was like, I fucking hate this teacher. I fucking hate this class. And why am I here? I just want to write. I just want to write. And I think some of it is in university, I was looking for a process that would help me kind of deepen my style. And in some ways, I had certain teachers nudge me in certain right directions. I took creative nonfiction class and that was deeply impactful. Um, I took a few like fiction courses that I really loved. But in all the ways that I didn't feel seen as an English major, I also found ways outside of the classroom to develop myself as an artist, to explore things. And, and I'm really appreciative that I did this because I'd say my first year and a half of college, I was a little bit more conservative in terms of like what I knew and I was a little bit more sheltered. And then I kind of delved more into like more university spaces. I started going to more queer orgs. I found um, a writing night on my campus every Tuesday night that I started going to. I started reading poetry there. And then through different friends in the English department, I joined this student theater group called Los Flamingo Company. And so I started writing short little plays and co-directing. And I was doing that and then doing the spoken word off campus. And then by my senior year, I remember I got approached to write a column for the student newspaper because I was organizing a lot and doing a lot of stuff for student government. And so I look at my later years in college and I realize like, oh, it, was, it wasn't it was about needing to fit into a box. It was more about finding my community outside of the box that was given to me. And that was hanging out with, with other college students who are writers and going to the Smiling Skull and talking about poetry over beers, doing workshops on the weekend. I look at all of the extracurricular things that I did and I see how that helped me grow as a writer because I started learning about more about black literature. I started learning about different forms. I started really getting into beatnik literature and understanding that there were kind of countercultural elements of writing that I really, really admired. And so it didn't, why would I find all this glory and wisdom in a classroom when really what I wanted were to revere writers that were out in the world experiencing things, um, doing things that were controversial, taking chances, going on long trips being adventurous. And so in a lot of ways, college was a challenge. And there are a lot of times where I didn't feel like a literary enough writer or or <laughs> as academic as other people. I don't fucking know. I'm also just not someone that can be like, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether Even though I do love Hamlet, 
let's say that. I graduated university in 2015, and then fast forward to 2017, I'm traveling in the Philippines for about three months. And while I'm traveling, I start to learn about freelance writing, and I start to learn that this is something that you can do, and I needed a remote income at the time, and I started getting into freelance writing through writing for Teen Vogue, Daily Dot, Afropunk. I entered freelance writing slash journalism, cynical towards mainstream media, cynical towards journalism, and how it misconstrues movement spaces. And so basically the two categories of writing that I was doing was cultural essays, movie reviews, and journalism. And the cultural essays and movie reviews I had down, but on some level, there were a few years in my freelance journey where I was experimenting with the idea of being a movement journalist or being a features journalist or investigative journalist, like using journalism as a way to expose structural wrongs. And although I did end up writing a few features, I wrote a really great feature on ShotSpotter, which is a predictive policing technology that is put into different neighborhoods and predicts gunshots, even though there's all sorts of evidence that it literally just will record fireworks as gunshots. I never studied journalism traditionally. I entered it as a movement person. And so I think there's a lot of like structural things or process oriented things that I never really knew. There's things about like FOIA requests and how to do more investigative things or how to find all these different sources to fill out your piece. And a lot of how I entered freelancing was intuitive while also like talking to people that I knew. And so there were various times in my freelance career where I really admired and loved how I could delve into cultural topics and issues, but some part of me felt insecure or not capable of writing things that were more damning and journalistic and more quantitative. And some of this is kind of the contradiction between knowing that I want my writing and work to always be in service of radicalism, but also knowing that in order for it to be more journalistic, it needs to fit into a system that I don't, I don't really fully agree with, because I do think a lot of journalism is based in business, incentive, ad dollars. I think in the ways that I want it to be more journalistic and to be more legible in this writing space, I also realized that being legible in a certain way involves sacrifices. It involved a lot more work in a direction that didn't always feel justified to me. It involved a lot of needing to like jump through hoops in a system like journalism, like freelance media, that isn't always fair to the worker, to the laborer. Um, even if I were to put on all, in all this all this work on a journalistic level to write all these longer pieces, how long would it take me to get paid? How many other writers and people would I have to fight against? How much time would I have to spend per week devoting towards this particular iteration of what being an artist or someone in the media would look like? And is that actually what I wanted? I think I wanted to be respected the different ways that I could write, but I didn't want to have to perform or do things that would align me with a certain part of the industry. And so even in this area of rejection that I felt, I still felt a certain sense of like conflict around my own desire, which was maybe you don't actually want to be a journalist. Maybe you want to be incisive in other ways and how you look at the world and how you write about things. And I really view the pandemic as an intense time for everyone, but on an individual level, it allowed me to reorient how I wanted to make money, what was necessary for me to, make, me, me to make money. And I think the other thing I look back at is that when I was freelancing, I was in survival mode. Now I don't need to be in survival mode and I don't really feel the drive as much to write journalistically. This is probably the biggest era of my creative life where I really had to face what rejection would feel like. And I've actually done two different videos about this on why being on submissions can be so hard as an artist. And if you haven't checked those out, for those that don't know, I published my first book two years ago. It's titled When They Tell You To Be Good. It's a memoir about my life that came out with Tin House Books. And I got the idea for the book in 2016, a little bit before I started freelance writing. And then I started writing it Got a literary agent. That literary agent left after a year. We hadn't really signed officially, but we were in talks to work with each other. I finished the book in 2020. I had an agent around the time, and it went on submissions in 2021. Submissions was really fucking hard. It was way harder than I expected, and it was a variety of reasons. We weren't the right person for it, which, like which to me sounds like... I don't know. It like if I think of it that way, I'm like, okay, like I can appreciate that, I guess. Wait, but I don't want to wait. But it's like waiting is what makes it worth it. So I might as well just fucking be patient. Oh my god. What if I die and this book never gets published? So I've been sitting here kind of trying to process 
why I feel like I'm kind of in shock. Um, I mean, I think it is a lot naturally to hear rejection when you've worked so hard on something. So I think that's a part of it. I think the other part of it is like the lack of control. <laughs> like I can only control the work that I've done, which I'm so proud of. And I know the right person will love it. And so the people that have said no, it's like, these weren't the right people. But I think the other side of it is just it's kind of scary that I've made it this far. Like I've literally made it this far. I wrote numerous books in high school. I wrote this book. I got an agent off of it. I got into like five or six writing residencies. I mean, it, it took me to France and I know I did that shit. I know I wrote that shit. I know I wrote it. Um, and so it's just also kind of scary to be so close to your dream and to kind of like feel it like, I don't know. It's, it's like I've worked so hard at it and this was something that was just in my head for so long and now I brought it into the world and now I have an agent who will fight for it for me. I don't know, maybe that's why it feels scarier in a way because I think until now I didn't really fully have to consider the realities of like whether or not someone from I don't know. The, the other objective thing is a memoir is, according to my agent, one of the hardest genres to sell. I had been traumatized by all of the organizing and protests that were happening in 2020 related to the George Floyd Rebellion. I was seeing all this news about more diverse books, like Black Writers Matter, like we're going to buy your books. And I worked so hard on my book. And my book is all about organizing, about being Black, about masculinity, about travel, about what it means to live a radical life. So I was like, all right, mass mobilization happening, horrific election, like maybe my voice could be useful. And <laughs> we went on submissions and we went through two different rounds of submissions. My book probably was rejected upwards of like 21 times all, all total. And I mean, there were a few like manuscript requests. A lot of the feedback was relatively vague. I mean, a lot of it was about we didn't fall in love with it on a line level, or we don't know if we can help this break out, but we we understand the power of this project. Mind you, around this time, I my agent was leaving, parting ways with me in the summer. I got a bad, bad book offer in the summer of 2021, said no to it. I also went to an artist residency where the administration of it were really fucked up and not transparent, and we're trying to kick out an indigenous artist. I ended up leaving, and... Oh my God, was that the year that that happened? And then my friend died. And then my writing mentor died. And then I got a book offer from someone that was getting hired to a publisher as an editor that had already rejected my book. And so I was, even when this person was like, oh, I want to publish your book, Hanif Abdurraqib, part of me was thinking, you're... They already rejected my book. They don't actually like my writing. You like my writing. And and I think what felt satisfying about this is that the editor is a local author, had read my writing before, is a genius. Like, literally, look up Hanif Abdurraqib, genius. I think what felt weird to me was knowing that this was a local person, also a black person. And so on some level, I was just thinking, like, oh, you want to help me break in. Like, you don't really, I don't know, whatever. And so that was weird. And I think being on submissions having so many people say no, having the publisher that ended up taking my book say no, and then they said yes because of my editor. And then also like searching for a new agent in this process, having people be like, oh, I loved your query letter, but I wasn't really sure if it was right for me, but now that you have a book deal, I'll represent you. And so there were just so many things that made me feel weird, made me feel isolated. I felt weird that my book was sold in this way that felt like it was a favor. I felt weird that I had been rejected so much. I felt weird that I needed to like scramble to get an agent. I felt weird that I had already gotten a book offer that was bad and I had to say no to. And I was grieving. And oh my God, I rejection just felt so complex for me at the time because leading up to the point where I actually got my good book offer with Tin House, I remember talking to all of my friends and I remember just saying like, if this dream doesn't happen with this book, I just need to accept it. 
not everyone's dreams happen. And the sooner I can acknowledge it, the sooner I can maybe move on and figure out what else is next for me. That to me is a very important part of dealing with rejection. Sometimes when we're in the throes of it or we fear it, it can be really important to literally name what our worst case scenario is. Name what, what we fear will happen. So even if it does happen, you're kind of like, at least I knew. Or if it doesn't happen, you're like, oh, ha ha ha, that was just me being silly. <laughs> And I, I really felt like no one was willing to take a chance on my book. Like I knew that what I'd written was important. I knew that it mattered to me, but in terms of whether or not it would matter to other people, I think some part of me had to admit like, maybe it will only matter to me. Maybe it will only matter to a handful of people. And that's hurtful, it's sad, but I don't think being traditionally published is going to even give me the validation that I think rejection is like taking away, if that makes sense. The cherry on top of all of this was my grieving processes. I mean, even when I got my book deal, I remember having to wait to make the announcement and then the announcement came out and all these people were congratulating me. And I was saying thank you from all these people, but I was also fucking grieving. This sense of isolation made it almost feel like oh, I'm getting my dream, but it isn't feeling the way that I thought it would. And not that this is a particular kind of rejection, but it takes away some of the, some of the sweetness and it almost feels like a rejection of the fullness of what this moment could be. And I don't really know what fully helped me through it. I mean, I think it was time. I think time helped me navigate what grieving was meaning for me and why it mattered that I was grieving and what grieving meant in my life in relation to a memoir that's a lot of it is about grieving. Um, I think also in terms of all my insecurities as a writer and being rejected, another thing that really helped me was having a good editor, having a good team. Hanif Abdurraqib really respected my book and really gave me great ideas in terms of feedback and editing. And I think having my work respected on a writing level really removed all of those insecurities because I was like, okay, now aside from all those insecurities, here is where I get to do the work. And then now, as a published author, how do I re deal with the rejection, you might ask? Uh, oh my God. I, I don't know. I am at a point in my career where I believe in my artistry. I believe in my ability to do it. I believe in the things that I have to say. I believe in my skill levels. I do still feel gatekept in a certain way. I am waiting to hear back from my agent about final feedback on my book. I have a really good feeling about it. But some part of me has worked so hard on this book is because I love that my first book was published and that it's out in the world. But in a way, I still feel like I need to and want to prove myself as a writer in different genres and different areas of the writing world. And so this book is an opportunity for me to kind of face a certain kind of insecurity or rejection I felt, applying for grants, opportunities. I've gotten so many rejections the past few weeks and it hasn't been feeling good. Some of what can remedy this is just simply, what I've been kind of doing today is just sitting down and planning. I think rejection hurts a lot more when we devote so much of our focus on a few different opportunities, when instead casting a wider net will lead to more rejection, but you'll kind of be more used to it. And I think that's kind of what I've been working through with balancing teaching, finishing my novel, editing and doing stuff online, organizing different podcast stuff. It's been hard to peg down time to kind of do the more administrative work or to plan out what things I want to apply to and do. And this isn't to say that I haven't gotten opportunities this year. I visited an MFA program. I have a job that I might potentially get next year. I've been reached out to about one or two potential job related things. I've been seeing my numbers grow on social media. I feel great in a lot of ways, but in the areas where I feel like I'm working on the longer term things, I don't feel as fulfilled or as seen or is validated. And some of that is like wanting a passive income. Some of that is wanting to feel like I'm not on the outside looking in. I have writer friends that are working at a universities or they get accepted to fellowships that I wanted and then they got a book deal and I'm still waiting for my second book deal. Um, I know people that have like been hired or all these things and envy is not a great thing, but I do think it makes us aware 
of what is out there and what we kind of desire for ourselves. And this isn't to say that envy is necessarily good, but I do think in some ways it can kind of put a fire under you or kind of compel you to kind of say like, okay, like they got that, what do I want for me? I'm like, I will always congratulate people, but I think inside of myself when I do feel envy or jealousy or weirdness, especially when I'm in the middle or in between working on major projects, it is important to kind of check in with myself and wonder why. And sometimes envy can like awaken like a certain kind of desire in you that can make you productive. And sometimes that productive productivity is good. And sometimes it can be really bad and destructive on almost like you're punishing yourself. And so it, it's really important to understand what these feelings of rejection are awakening in you. And if it's, and if you're having a healthy response and I think a healthy response can look like, I know that I've worked hard. I know every opportunity can't come my way, but how can I temperature check what this emotion is and not blame myself, but figure out what the steps are moving forward that can help me get closer to X, Y, Z thing. Acknowledge what we're feeling. Acknowledge that it doesn't even need to be our fault that we're feeling this. And that three, there are actionable steps that can help us deal with the underlying emotion of rejection or or jealousy or insecurity, which is typically like, not feeling good enough or not feeling good enough to achieve or reach a certain opportunity. And this all is very muddled and confused in my mind because on some levels, I know people can look at me and be like, oh my God, you have a book published and you're teaching and blah, blah, blah. And this isn't to say like I'm unhappy about where I am, but I think the reality is, is that in terms of where I want to be and what I know could be possible now, I do feel Like there are certain ways that the industry, I'm still waiting for the industry to keep up with me or I'm waiting for the industry to meet the things that I'm trying to do. Or I guess it's like the, in other words, I'm waiting to be put on. Like I got put on with my first book, but what about the second, third, fourth? What about my sponsorship? What about X, Y, Z? And rejection can make all of these future possibilities seem so far away. But I also know rejection is an opportunity to check in with myself and kind of say, I have worked so hard on this last book. I have been podcasting for four years. I've been teaching. I basically have taught myself how to be a teacher in a lot of ways. And there are so many things that I've learned intuitively or through like really digging in and diving into things. And I know that I have a lot of skill sets that a lot of other people don't have in terms of these areas. And I want to honor that. No matter how rejection makes you feel, I do think... The blessing of being an artist, the blessing of being someone that tries to be present in the world, the blessing of fighting and defending your own version of life is that I get to fall in love with the behind the scenes work. I get to wake up and to think, I get to write today, or I get to work on my podcast today, or I get to research these cool, interesting things about the world that I live in. And the rejection will never take away that joy. It might make it more difficult to access sometimes, but I think the counterforce to rejection is really understanding and re-navigating why we love the things that we do in the first place anyway and reigniting those different aspects of the process whether that be hanging out with your artist friends that make you feel good and create creating things communally whether that be doing things that are weird or are are passionate or interesting to you like earlier this year i started sewing like i, I feel like another way that i've counteracted some of these things is just trying to find new hobbies that are interesting or weird or upgrading certain skill sets like getting a new microphone or learning a new video editing software, learning to sew, um, finding simple and new things that kind of take you out of your comfort zone or your head, even with the way that you deal with the rejection or how you think about productivity or or value or quality when you're making your art. Um, find ways to rid yourself of those mindsets so that when you come to the different parts of your creative life that have to be judged or will be valued or will be weighed in a certain way, you have other things that kind of bring you joy differently. Rejection is an opportunity to check in with yourself and to figure out if you're feeling rejection because of envy, whether you're feeling rejection because of some kind of deeper wound, or is it something structural that you're trying to confront but you don't have the power or, or or way of confronting it on an individual level. What can I analyze or understand around the world around me and how I relate to it? And how can I how can it change my relationship to rejection when it comes up? I hope this video is one piece among many that helps you navigate rejection because it can lead to loneliness, it can lead to us devaluing ourselves or our artwork, and it can really become a blockage that I think is a part of life will always be there, but I don't think it 
we deserve to push past it because there are so many things that you can see, feel, and do beyond the boundaries of rejection. And so I hope this video has helped. Um, I'm definitely in a period of like reorienting and rethinking about things. Um, and I just know moving forward, like I want to keep writing. I want to keep deepening my skill sets in the areas of art that I care about. And I just want to devote time to like always kind of figuring out some part of my schedule where I can plan ahead. Because I think when rejection happens and I don't feel like I'm planning ahead, it almost feels like, oh, this is it, right? <laughs> and it's not, it's not. And so that can be another tip as well. Like, comment, and subscribe. Tell me down below with how you deal with rejection. And thank you for everyone who's been watching my channel. Stay tuned because pretty soon I'm gonna be launching The Black Radical Reader this month in June, which is a collection of essays about black history and black solidarity with Palestine. I'm really, really excited about it. It's my first self-published book ever and I love that it aligns with so many things that I'm talking about online, so many things that I'm doing in my life and research for other writing that I'm going to be doing in the future. So stay tuned for that. Check out the description of this video to learn more and let me know what other kind of videos about the writing life that you'd like to see on this channel because I do have so many other things that I want to record but I want to hear from you. See you next time.